Well, Lord, we thank you that you are the everlasting God. We thank you for this opportunity to be able to come together, worship you, worship your holy name. We pray, Lord, that as we open the Bible now, that you would speak to our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you'd like to turn in your Bibles to the book of Jeremiah, we are ready for Jeremiah chapter 5. Now, my friends, here's what's so exciting about studying Jeremiah. The situation in Judah was exactly the same thing as it is in America. There were those people who wanted to turn the nation completely away from God. And at the time that Jeremiah begins, there's a good king. His name is Josiah. Josiah began ruling when he was eight years old. By the time he was 20, about the time that Jeremiah started, Jeremiah's father, Hilkiah, had found the book of the Lord, the law of the Lord. It was lost in the temple of the Lord. And you go, how could that be? How could that take place? But I want to tell you, there are all kinds of churches around the world today where the word of the Lord is lost in the house of the Lord because they don't believe it anymore. Uh, you may know people that have Bibles in their homes, but never open it. So the word of the Lord being lost. And when they read the word of the Lord, it was, it was so exciting to them. But they also realized something. Wait a minute. We're in deep trouble. We, we have turned our heart away from the Lord. I want to remind you something. When... George Washington took his oath of office, his very first oath of office, he placed his hands on Deuteronomy chapter 28. That was not by accident. Deuteronomy chapter 28 basically says this, you walk with me, I'm going to bless you in the country, I'm going to bless you in the city, I'm going to make you the head and not the tail. You're going to be a lender to the nations and not a borrower. But my friends, in my lifetime, we have seen America go from being a lender to the nations to a borrower of the nations in a very short period of span, exactly coinciding with our nation turning its heart and its faith against God. Now, here's the deal. Jeremiah was the prophet who is going to be called to oversee the demise of, of Judah, can you imagine having that ministry? How hard that would be? And something else we're going to see, his message wasn't very popular. Well, guess what? When we speak the truth of God's word today, how popular are we? Yeah, not so much. So let's begin in chapter 5. The first of about 10 action sermons. Run to and fro through the streets of Jerusalem and see now and know and seek in her open places if you can find a man, if there is anyone who executes judgment, who seeks truth, and I will pardon her. My friends, he was called to see whether there were any righteous. Are there any righteous? What does the Bible say? There, no, not one. Re, uh, Romans chapter 3, verse number 10. There is none righteous, no, not one. In Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, who God set forth to be a propitiation by his blood. And again, as on Sunday mornings, we're in the heart of the gospel, Jesus dying on the cross, we have to understand it had to happen. It is the only way that salvation can be attained is by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. So he's running through the streets, Jeremiah's message. And in verse number two, though they say, as the Lord lives, we have a phrase in our country, in God we trust. It's in the back of the House of U.S. Representatives, before where, where the Speaker of the House sits, right right. Right there. Great big letters. In God we trust. But you see, my friends, does having that sign on the wall mean anything? It doesn't mean anything if there is the heart to back it up. So there was a popular phrase in that day, as the Lord lives. Well, who cares? That's like saying, God bless you when someone sneezes. It's not exactly a great statement of faith. It goes on in verse 3. 
O Lord, are not your eyes on truth? You have stricken them, but they have not grieved. You have consumed them, but they have refused to receive correction. And they have made their faces harder than rock and have refused to return. Therefore, I said, surely these are poor. They are foolish, for they do not know the way of the Lord, the judgment of their God. I will go to the great men and speak to them, for they have known the way of the Lord and the judgment of their God. But these have altogether broken the yoke, burst the bonds. Therefore, a lion, that's always a symbol of Babylon, from the forest shall slay them. A wolf of the deserts, even if they run to the desert, they're not going to be saved. They shall destroy them. A leopard shall watch over their cities. Everyone who goes out from there shall be torn into pieces because of the, their transgressions are many and their backsliding have increased. How shall I pardon you for this? Your children have forsaken me and sworn by those that are not God. When I have fed them to the full, they committed adultery and assembled themselves as troops in the harlot's house. They were like well-fed, lusty stallions. Everyone neighed after his neighbor's wife. Shall I not punish them for these things, says the Lord? And shall I not avenge myself on such a nation as this? Where we are as a nation, in our moral free fall as society, is nothing new. You have to understand, it is the collapse of society. When sexual immorality becomes rampant, because here's what happens. Families are destroyed. I, I'm actually old enough to remember when, if you got a divorce, there was a stigma to go along with it. Uh, when I was in high school, if there was a teacher in the public school living an immoral lifestyle, they would have been fired. Because teachers were to be representatives of standards to the students that they were teaching. But my friends, we live in a society now where seriously, just regular TV? I mean, it's, it's what it used to be, at least are in the movies. I remember the, one of the first R-rated movies that I saw was Goldfinger. Well, that would be rated G today. Seriously. And what's on regular TV, but here's the thing. It grows, it spreads, it destroys, families are destroyed. Adultery destroys families. That's just the way that it goes. And here's the picture of it. And the sexual sins, and the Lord said, this is why I'm judging you. As it was in the days of Noah, so is it going to be when the Son of Man returns. And guess what? There were aberrant sexual practices taking place in the days of Noah. Go up on our walls and destroy, but do not make a complete end. Take away our branches, for they are not the Lord's. The Lord's house and the house of, of Judah have dealt very treacherous with me, says the Lord. They have lied about the Lord, and they have said, Is it not he, neither will evil come upon us, nor shall we see sword or famine. Here's where people make a mistake. When the judgment of God does not come immediately, the liberals, the progressives, they'll say, see, God doesn't care. There's an apathy or worse yet, God approves of what we're doing. Let, let's celebrate it. And it goes on to say in verse number 13, and the prophets become wind for the word is not in them and thus it shall be done to them. Therefore, thus says the Lord God of hosts, because you speak this word, because I will make my words in your mouth of fire, and this people would, and it shall devour them. Behold, I will bring a nation against you from afar, says the house of the Lord, a mighty nation, a nation, nation, a nation whose language you do not know, nor can you understand what they say. Their quiver is like an open tomb. They are all mighty men. They shall eat up your harvest, your bread, which your sons and daughters should eat. They shall eat up your flocks, your herds. They shall eat up your vines, your fig trees. They shall destroy your fortified cities in which you trust. 
uh, with a sword. And again, my friends, we have no idea what it's like to have a conquering army come through. I want to tell you, there's all kinds of Christians in Iraq that know what that's like. There's all kinds of people in Syria that know what that's like. And again, nevertheless, in those days, I will not make a complete end of you. And it will be when you say, why does the Lord our God do all these things to us? Then you shall answer them, just as you have forsaken me and have served foreign gods in your land, so you shall serve aliens in a land that's not yours. You say, they wanted to worship idols? But God said, all right, you want to worship idols? You're going to be slaves in the head of the land of Babylon, going all the way back to Genesis chapter 10 and the Tower of Babel. You, this is what you want? Then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have you go there. Declare this in the house of Judah and proclaim it, or Jacob, and proclaim it in Judah, saying, Hear this now, O foolish people, without understanding, who I have eyes and see not, who have ears and hear not. Do you not fear me, says the Lord? Will you not tremble at my presence, you who have placed the sand as a bound to the sea by a perpetual decree that it cannot pass, though its waves toss to and fro, and yet they cannot prevail, though they roar, and yet they cannot pass it by? My friends, you go to the coast, the ocean. I mean, the powerful ocean that hits the shore every day, but can't go any farther, can it? The Lord God is the creator. And in verse 23, but this people has a defiant and a rebellious heart. They have re revolted and departed. They do not say in their heart, let us now fear the Lord our God. My friends, do you want to have a rebellious and a defiant heart? A very simple question. Do you want to rebel against what the Lord says? Because that's what we're finding. That the nations of the world, they want to cast off the restraints of the Lord. The Supreme Court of our land, they want to cast off the, the, the supreme truth of the Scriptures. And they want to say, well, we're the ones that are going to make the rules and the law is not God. So is that what you want? Do you want to be defiant? Do you want to be rebellion? Do you want to be deviant? And instead, do you want, let us now fear the Lord our God, who gives rain, both the former and the latter rain in his season. He reserves for us the appointed weeks of the harvest. I'm going to ask you a farm question. Why do you need a former rain and why do you need a latter rain? You know the answer? Well, right now in Kansas, they're getting ready to plant wheat. They plant wheat in September. True story, Labor Day's coming this weekend. My father had me totally convinced my entire life till I got married that Labor Day was a day they let you out of school so you could clean seed wheat. I did not, I truly did not know until after I got married and my wife goes, what are we going to do for Labor Day? And I looked at her like, what? clean seed wheat. <laughs> but here's the thing, in order to plant wheat, you have to have former rains. You have to have the early rains and the latter rains. You have to have it because if it's too dry, you're wasting your time putting, putting wheat in the ground. There has to be moisture in the ground. You have to receive the latter rains as well because when it grows up, there's a certain time where you better get rain on it. If you don't get rain on it, you're not going to have a crop. Okay, so that's the former rains and the latter rains. Now it goes on in verse number 25 your iniquities have turned these things away, and your sins have withheld good things from you. I want you to say that last part of the verse with me. And your sins have withheld good things from you. Again, and your sins have withheld good things from you. Okay, been dealing with kids for 40 years. We've had a school here for 20 years. And it's so interesting watching kids because you can tell when kids start going into a rebellion. And here's the funny thing. 
they think they're hiding it from you. Instead, it's like they're walking around with a sign over their head that I have an attitude and I'm in rebellion against the Lord, you know. But they think they're sneaky about it. But here's the reality. Why don't they want to walk with the Lord? They think they're going to miss out on something. I don't want to give my heart to the Lord, you know. I mean, I want to have a good time. You know, I'll give my heart to the Lord when I'm old like Pastor Gerald, you know, right before he dies. But I'm not going to do it now. And here's the thing, that is a direct lie of the enemy, isn't it? Because I have come to give you life and to give you life more abundantly. And everything that the world is telling you is fun, yeah, not so much, huh? Some of it can downright kill you or make you wish you were dead. And the scripture goes on, for among my people are found wicked men, They lie in wait as one who sets snares. They set a trap. They catch men. As a cage is full of birds, so their houses are full of deceit. Therefore, they have become great and grown rich. I just saw something on the news yesterday that's happening in Colorado, who became the first state to legalize marijuana for recreational use. Guess what their problem is? Kids like eating those marijuana brownies. And how do you tell whether a marijuana has brownies in it or not? And so it has actually become a huge problem. Really? You didn't know stupid people of Colorado? Really? You didn't realize these are the consequences of it? Hallelujah, Yucca Valley voted it down. The- Let them go somewhere else. Leave us alone. They have grown fat. They are sleek. Yes, they surpass the deeds of wickedness. They do not plead the cause, the cause of the fatherless, and yet they prosper. And the right of the needy, they do not defend. My friends, in Revelation chapter 18, we have commercial Babylon. Commercial Babylon, which exploits poor people. You need to understand, God did have a way, and he was going to make Israel a different nation. Now, they just didn't follow this. In the nation of Israel, which isn't very big. You guys all know that, right? I mean, the nation of Israel is like Rhode Island, okay? It's like Vermont. You know, it's one of those tiny little states that you can't even write the name Israel on the map. It has to be in the Mediterranean Ocean. You know, it's not that tiny. But here's what they did. The 12 tribes of Israel were allotted different pieces of land. Within the 12 tribes of Israel, the families that were in that 12 tribes were all given land. And here's the thing, and this is what's so big about This is actually why Israel was thrown out of the land. Because they never honored this. The Lord said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to work six years. And in the sixth year, I'm going to give you enough grain. You're not going to have to work the seventh year. I like it. A year off every seven years? I'm thinking that's a great deal. But you know what happened? They worked six years and they went, woohoo! Gosh, if we plant next year, we'll get a, that much more. And so they didn't do this. Then the Lord had it laid out. You know what? Let's say you're a bad manager. And you're just not good with money at all. And so you have to mortgage your farm. Every 50 years, all lands had to revert to the original family owners. You realize what a great deal that was? Because it equalized everything. My friends, we have a saying, the rich get richer. In my lifetime, I've seen a complete change in America. When I was a little kid and we went to town, we went to a family-owned mom-and-pop drugstore, a family-owned clothing store, a family-owned car dealership, a family-owned plumber, a family-owned hardware store, 
There were very few rich people in our town. People who worked hard, they were able to buy a home, a modest home, but they were owners. They employed people, and there was this huge middle class. Very few people, way, 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 way rich. There were some, and there were some poor, but there was actually a big class of everybody just working hard. What do we have today? We have Walgreens. Could you own an independent drugstore in Yucca Valley? I'm pretty sure Rite Aid and Walgreens would eat your lunch. Could you own an independent dress company? Could you compete with Ross? There's only one store I know can compete with Ross's prices. That's Joshua Springs Thrift Store. Outside of that, I seriously... Uh, you know, and, and Marshall, I mean, some of those clothes you can sell for what you can buy them for, all right? Can anybody compete with Walmart? So what do we have? We have a very few, very, very rich people and a whole lot of people working at minimum wage because that's the society, the way that it goes. But the Lord had a different plan than that. He doesn't like to see people oppressed, he doesn't like that. And our founding fathers, it was one of the things that they wanted was a freedom, a freedom from government, a, a realization that our freedoms, what we have, they don't come from man, they don't come from God, they come or, or from other people or government, they come from God alone. We hold these truths to be self-evident. So you have to understand God had a plan. Now the scripture goes on. Astonishing and horrible things has com been committed in the land. Verse 31, the prophets prophesy falsely and the priests rule by their own power and my people love to have it so. But what will you do in the end? My friends, why do we have the government that we have? We elected it. That's the way the people wanted it to be. Now in chapter 6, O oh, you children of Benjamin, which was the small tribe, them and Judah comprised Judah, gather yourselves to flee from the midst of Jerusalem. Bro blow the trumpet in Tekoa. Tekoa is where Amos is from. And set up a signal fire in Beth Hekarim. For disaster appears out of the north. Again, that's Babylon. A great destruction. I've likened the daughter of Zion to a lovely and delicate woman. The shepherds with her flock shall come to her. They shall pitch her tents against her all around. Each one shall pastor in his own place. Prepare war against her. Arise and let us go up at noon. Woe for us as the day goes away and the shadows of the evening are lengthening. Arise and let us go by night and let us destroy her pal palaces. For thus has the Lord of hosts said, hewn down trees. They're going to hew down these trees to make battering rams and build a mound against Jerusalem. This is city is to be punished. She is full of oppression in her midst. And as a fountain wells up with water, so she wells up with wickedness. So it's like polluted water coming out. It's not clean anymore. And there's wickedness and violence and plundering are heard in her before me continually are grief of wounds. My friends, I want to tell you, violence is increasing in our land. Violence is increasing in Yucca Valley. There's a reason for it. They're letting criminals out. And they're bringing them up here. The reality is when a society turns its heart away from the Lord, as it was in the days of Noah, you know what was going on in the days of Noah? Violence was filling the land. And my friends, violence is filling the land again. And it's not a gun problem, it's a heart problem. There have always been lots of guns. I grew up in the Midwest. Always guns. I could have walked out in our school parking lot and got 20 guns out of unlocked pickups any day of the week and nobody thought one thing about it because there was a different heart. 
Now, as the heart has turned away from the Lord, we have violence. My friends, it grieves my heart, and I encourage every one of us, let's pray for the law enforcement of America. As far as I'm concerned, if someone says that cops should be shot, they should be arrested. That, That is a death threat. And my friends, I lay the blame squarely at the President of the United States and the Attorney General. They're the ones that started this. And it's absolutely repulsive what we're watching in our country. But it is a moral issue. It is an issue. It is a result. You cannot separate it. It comes when a nation turns their heart away from the living God. Violence is going to increase in the land. In verse 8, be instructed, O Jerusalem, lest my soul depart from you, lest I make you desolate, a land not inhabited. Thus says the Lord of hosts, they shall thoroughly glean as a vine the remnant of Israel, as a grape gatherers, Put your hand back into the branches to whom I speak and give warning that they may hear. Indeed, their ear is uncircumcised. In Jeremiah 4, 4, their heart was uncircumcised. Now their ear is uncircumcised. And again, although you can hear the words, if you don't listen, it doesn't matter. And the scripture goes on. Behold, and they cannot give heed. Behold, the word of the Lord is a reproach to them, and they have no delight in it. Does that not describe America to you today? That the word of God is a reproach. That's how Hollywood treats it. That's how our political parties teach it. That's how our public education system treats it. It is a reproach. Therefore, I'm full of fury of the Lord. I'm weary of holding it in. I will pour it out on the children outside, on the assembly of the young men together. For even the husband shall be taken with the wife and the aged with him who's full of days. And their houses shall be turned over to other and fields and wives together. For I will stretch out my hand against the inhabitants of the land, says the Lord. Because from the least of them to the greatest of them... Everyone is given to covetousness. From the prophet even to the priest, everyone deals falsely. The Bible tells us in Colossians chapter 3, in verse number 1, If you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is setting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above and not on things of the earth. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Therefore, put to death. There are things we got to kill in our lives. Put to death your members which are on the earth. Fornication. That's having sex outside of marriage. Uncleanliness. Just dirty filthiness. Pornography would go in that category. Passion evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Why does God ask us to tithe? Is it because God's broke? And God's work will not continue on unless you give. And I, I can cry if I try. I can do it really good. Please, brothers. But I want to tell you, God's not broke, all right? Does God need our money for his kingdom to, go? And, you know? Then why does he have us give? The answer, my friends, is this. Jesus said, wherever your heart or your treasure is, that's where your heart's going to be. My friends, this is a very simple test. If you're keeping all your money to, for yourself, where's your heart? Where is it? You have to say it. Where's your heart? If you're keeping all your money to yourself, where is your heart? Selfish. It's selfish. And my friends, don't you all have good tastes? Don't we? We have a gift of liking things more expensive than we can afford. 
If I walk into a furniture store, I, my eye is immediately drawn to that gorgeous piece of furniture. Someone told me yesterday, did you know this? You can buy a watch that costs $103,000. Really? Can you live in it? Does it drive? I mean, for that much money, you ought to be able to live in it and drive it, right? But here's the thing. When we give, it sets us free. Our lives are not going to be measured by what we get. Do you understand that? They're going to be measured by what we give. Of ourself, our time, our talents, our treasures. So when we give, I got to tell you a funny story. Someone just signed up for our Matthew 19, 14 plan. And they signed up the next day. They signed the papers, the automatic withdrawal, the whole kit and caputo. Next day, they go to work, they get a 12% raise that they had no idea they were getting. Called me up so excited. I got a raise. I got a 12% raise. This is what's exciting to me about this program. You know what? You give, you're going to be blessed. That's the bottom line. But covetousness is the exact opposite. Covetousness is I want, I want, I want. And it really irritates me that you got something that I want. And the Bible says it's idolatry. Verse 14 They've also healed the hurt of my people slightly, saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. Again, my friends, I want to tell you, in the coming of the Lord, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, the scripture says in verse number 3, for when they, not us, say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. I want to tell you unequivocally, without any apology, this peace accord with Iran is no peace deal whatsoever, and there will be a war, and Iran will be a part of it. This very day, they are chanting death to America. One of the supreme rulers there said, because John Kerry was saying, Please release to us our held captives. And we're having prayer and fasting for Pastor Saeed and the others. We're going to have a special service. uh, I believe it's the 26th of September, the last Saturday in September at our 6 o'clock service. But I want to tell you, you know what one of the leaders said? We don't care at all what you say. They say exactly what they're going to do. They are going to try to annihilate Israel. But my friends, God is not going to let them. And Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39 will be fulfilled. And I'm sorry to tell you, the president just got the last senator that he needs to override the veto of Congress on that. Now the scripture goes on to say this. In verse number 15, were they ashamed when they committed abominations? No, they were not at all ashamed, nor do they know how to blush. No, the opposite is true. There's pride in sin today. Therefore, they shall fall among those who fall. And at that time, I punish them. They shall be cast down, says the Lord. Thus says the Lord, stand in the ways and see and ask for the old paths where the good way is and walk in it. Then you will find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk in it. And also I set a watchman over you saying, listen to the sound of the trumpet. But they said, we will not listen. My friends, I want to tell you something about our founding fathers. They weren't dumb people. They were highly educated, very intelligent, who had studied Ancient civilizations through modern civilizations. They absolutely... Do you realize that in those days, Harvard and Yale were seminaries? And in order to be a freshman at Harvard or Yale, you had to be able to write your own copy of the New Testament in Greek. 
If you don't believe how smart these people were, do a Google search for the state of Kansas 8th grade graduation test. Now, mind you, in the 1800s, these were all one-room schools. This 8th grade test could not be passed by those in Harvard today. I'd be willing to say not a person in this room could pass that test. And again, they were highly intelligent. They had studied the rise and the fall of civilizations. They wanted America to be an exceptional nation. That's why they put in the three branches of government. That's why they're they're in those three branches. There were checks and balances. That's why they put in the Bill of Rights. But my friends, our founding fathers wrote this. This government will only work for a moral people. If it ever ceases to be a moral and a religious people, the Bill of Rights will be used to usher in every form of evil. And I want to ask you a question. Were they right? They were absolutely right. That's exactly where we are. So what we need... And America worked very well until the courts in our land, starting with denying prayer in school and the legalization of abortion and not listening to the Constitution of the United States of America. And again, my friends, Jeremiah is saying, we need to return to the good path. There is a good path. It's in the Bible. And I want to tell you, America needs a revival and needs to return to that good path. And I believe it's possible when God's people begin to rise and pray. I want to encourage you to go see a movie. It's called War Room. Absolutely. How many have seen it? Isn't it awesome? I mean, we were in the theater last night, spontaneous clapping twice during the movie. I mean, it's it's absolutely a great movie. And here's what's exciting. As we were watching the previews for this movie, there's four or five other great Christian movies coming out. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And this movie shocked Hollywood because it was the second highest grossing movie. It made over $11 million last week, so go see it, all right? War Room. It's powerful, and it's very challenging. In verse number 18, Hear now, you nations, and know, O congregation, what is among them. Hear, O earth, behold, I will certainly bring calamity on this people, even the fruit of their thoughts. And here's why. Because they have not heeded my words. This is what is happening. Nor my law, but rejected it. For what purpose to me comes frankincense from Sheba and sweet cane from a far country? Your burnt offerings are not acceptable, nor your sacrifices sweet to me. It doesn't matter what kind of religious rigmarole you go through. If your heart isn't with the Lord, all these things are meaningless. Therefore, thus says the Lord, Behold, I will lay stumbling blocks before this people. And their fathers and sons together shall fall on them, and the neighbor and his friend shall perish. I want to tell you, in the New Testament, the exact same thing is said. In 1 Peter chapter 2, 7, Therefore, to you who believe, he is precious. But to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. And listen, a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense they stumble being disobedient to the, uh, to the word to which they were appointed. My friends, broad is the road that leads to destruction. Many there are that go that way. Narrow is the road that leads to everlasting life. But here's the thing. On that broad road that leads to destruction where people are running as fast as they can in darkness. I don't know about you, but I ran smack dab into rocks in my way. Boom! When I was rebellious against the Lord. And here's the amazing thing. When I ran into that rock wall, I cursed God. When that rock wall was put there by God to keep me from going to hell. That's why it was there. 
And then I'd get up and run again in darkness as fast as I could. Boom! People are stupid. But there was a time where I went, wait a minute, I'm going the wrong way. Jesus has done everything he could that nobody has to go to hell, including putting up roadblocks. So my friends, let's heed the word of the Lord. What does First Peter say? They stumble being disobedient to the word to which they were appointed. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness, uh, called you into his marvelous light, who were once not a people, but are now the people of God, who had once not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Jeremiah 6, uh, 22. Thus says the Lord, Behold, a people comes from the north, and again, that's Babylon. A great nation will be raised from the farthest parts of the earth. They will lay hold of bow and spear. They are cruel and have no mercy. Their voice roars like the sea, and they ride on horses as men of war set in array against you, O daughter of Zion. My friends, we see these same people today. They're Muslims. They're ISIS. My friends, when they overrun a city, do you, do you know what happens? My friends, the atrocities are so horrendous that we can't even really talk about them in polite circles. Barbaric beyond measure, what they do to women, to what they do to little girls and little boys is beyond the depravity of human mankind. I just saw a picture the other day of four people that they captured. You know what they did to them? They hogtied them. You know what that means? They tied their hands and legs behind their backs, hoisted them up, and slowly roasted them alive. I want to tell you, this is why Jesus is coming back, and it is the great battle of the end of the age. And Islam has declared war on Christianity. My friends, the scripture goes on to say here, in verse 24, We have heard the report of it. Our hands grow feeble. Anguish has taken hold of us. Pain as of a woman in labor. The Bible talks about this in the coming of the Lord. As labor pains on a pregnant woman. Now, all ladies who have had a baby understand this far more than any man in this room. When you're a labor, having a baby, in the beginning, you're not sure whether it's labor or not. But honey, about five minutes before that baby's born, there ain't no doubt about what's going on here. And that's exactly how it's going to be. The pain is going to get greater in intensity and frequency, and it's going to happen. Do not go out in the field nor walk by the way because of the sword of the enemy. Fear is on every side, O daughter of my people. Clothe yourself with sackcloth and roll in ashes. Make mourning as for an only son, most bitter lamentation. For plunder will suddenly come upon us. Verse 27, this is the word of the Lord to Jeremiah. I have set you as an assayer and a fortress among my people that you may know and test their way. They are all stubborn rebel rebels, walking as slanders. They are bronze and iron. They are corruptors and bellows blow fiercely. The lead is consumed by fire. The smelter refines in vain. For the wicked are not drawn off. And people will call themselves rejected silver because the Lord has rejected them. Chapter 7. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, Stand in the gate of the Lord's house. Proclaim there this word. And say, hear the word of the Lord, all you in Judah and who enter at these gates to worship the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, amend your ways and your doing, and I will cause you to dwell in this place. Do not trust in these lying words saying, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these. My friends, there were those, and again, listen, they knew God dwelt in that temple. 
But my friends, they had no idea that God was departing from the temple. It was going to be an empty building that was going to be destroyed. To them, it had become like a lucky rabbit's foot, a good luck charm. The meaning was gone, even though sacrifices were still going on, even though people were still talking about the Lord, they weren't walking with the Lord. But then he gives an option. For if you thoroughly amend your ways and your doing, if you thoroughly execute judgment between man and his neighbor, if you do not oppress the stranger, the fatherless, the widow, and do not shed innocent blood in this place or walk after other gods to your heart, then I will cause you to dwell in this place, in the land that I gave your fathers forever and ever. Behold, you trust in lying words that cannot profit. Will you still murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, burn incense to Baal, and walk after other gods who you do not know? And then come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say, we are delivered to do all these abominations? Has this house, which is called by my name, become a den of thieves in your eyes? Behold, I, even I, have seen it, says the Lord. After the children of Israel would come back, And by the time we get to Jesus, what does Jesus call the temple area? I have designed my father's house to be a house of prayer, and you have made it what? Quoting this, a den of thieves. Do you understand history repeats itself? It changes name, but it repeats itself. It began in this country in the 1920s with the progressives. And the progressives wanted to progress, right? They wanted to change. They wanted every person to believe that they were evolved from an ape. They wanted prayer eliminated out of schools and called it progress. But my friends, you see it cycles over and over. And at a certain point, society becomes so corrupt that it just collapses on itself. That's what was happening here. And that's what's happening to these people. And it goes on in verse number 12. And this is so important. Mark this verse. Highlight this verse. Verse, but go now to my place which was in Shiloh where I set my name in first. I have a picture that I want to show you. Do you know which one? There it is. Okay. Okay. Why don't we shut off the lights all together so you can see. This is a satellite map of the nation of Israel. Now, I want to tell you, if you're standing there, there's no way that you could see this. You could only see it from space. No man had ever seen this until we got the satellite images from space. Does everybody understand? This is the natural topography of the nation of Israel. You see where Jerusalem is, right there. And then right over here, beside the square, is Shiloh. And the Bible says, in Shiloh, where I first put my name, inside the box, in the natural canyons and mountains, is in perfect Hebrew, the name of God. Remember, in the Old Testament, YHVH, every time in your Bible, in the Old Testament, when you see Lord with every letter capitalized, that's called the, tra- at, at trans- what's it called? That's what it's called. <laughs> and, but it's for four Hebrew letters. Y-H-V-H, which is the very name of God. And I want you to look how excited. I get goosebumps every time I look at this or talk about it. God stamped his name in the topography of the earth. Now, here's how they found it. When the satellite pictures began to be distributed, there was a hotel in Israel who said, Let's take Israel, because it's not a very big country, and let's make one wall of our hotel the, the picture of the topography of the entire state of Israel. So there the wallpaper putter on her was putting on the wallpaper, and they're right in front of him in perfect Hebrew, 
was the name of God. Is that awesome or what? So, for the United Nations, for the Pope, for the President, for everyone, in case you wonder whose land it is, God signed his name on it. it it's his land. Thanks, we can turn back up the lights. But I love that. Isn't that awesome? I mean, it's so powerful. Any Jew can read that. It is the very name of God. Hebrews, or I mean, uh, Jeremiah seven twelve. But go to my place, which was in Shiloh, where I set my name at first. And see what I did to it because of the wickedness of my people Israel. And again, Shiloh is the very first place where the tabernacle was. And now because you have done all these works, says the Lord, and I spoke to you rising up early and speaking, but you did not hear. I called you, but you did not answer. Therefore, I will do this to my house, which is called by not my name, in which you trust, and to this place, which I gave you, To you and your fathers, as I have done in Shiloh, I will cast you out of my sight, as I have cast out all your brethren and the whole posterity of Ephraim. Ephraim is that older sister. Ephraim was the ten northern tribes, Israel. They had gone into captivity years before, and Judah did not learn, as Jeremiah had said, from her older sister. I want to tell you something about America. America, when it was founded, our founding fathers got together and they said, we don't want to be like our older sister, Europe. We're going to build a nation that is completely different than Europe. It's going to be an exceptional nation. Quoting out of the Bible, a city that is set on a hill. And my friends, it is high time that we as God's people say, we don't want anything to be like Europe at all. They're godless humanists, and what they stand for is not what we stand for. We want to be a nation that is independent, one nation under God. And my friends, as we do that as God's people and rise up and demand righteous government, I do believe there can be a revival in this land, but it's going to begin with God's people. And I got great news for you. There are presidential candidates that are real born-again Christians. I ain't talking about a political Christian who goes to the Presbyterian church on Christmas Eve. I'm talking real born-again Christians who are not afraid to say, I believe in Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, and I'm cleansed by His blood. Hallelujah. So that's what we need. Now the scripture goes on. Therefore, do not pray for these people. Really? Are there people we shouldn't pray for? You realize the New Testament tells us that? In 1 John, chapter 5, it says in verse 16, If anyone sees his brother sinning a sin which does not lead to death, He will ask and he will give life to those who commit sin, not leading to death. Now I want you to listen. There is a sin leading to death. I do not say that he should pray about that. There is a time and a place where God gives people over to a reprobate mind. Now again, how do we know that? Well, I believe we should always pray for people. Always. But I do believe there is a time and a place and if God speaks that to your heart that they're just gone and you feel no compulsion to pray for them God's telling Jeremiah it's too late therefore do not pray for this people nor lift up a cry of prayer for them nor make intercession for me for I will not hear you do you not see what they do in the cities of Jerusalem or in the cities of Judah and the streets of Jerusalem The children gather wood and the fathers kindle a fire. And the women knead their dough to make cakes for the queen of heaven. For they pour out drink offerings to other gods that they may provoke me to anger. My friends, the term the queen of heaven 
It goes all the way back in the book of Genesis to the Babylonian mystery religion. It is Eshtar. We, we still have societies today. It, in Rome, it was Venus and Cupid. It, is, it was the worship of the Madonna and child. And you have to understand, in every culture there was that. It goes back to Nimrod and his wife uh, uh, Semiramis and their son Tammuz. And my friends, whenever you see those pictures of the halo around Mary and the halo around baby Jesus, it's just a kickback to these these pagan ways that go all the way back. And in every society they had names for it. In Mother Earth, it's another name for it in the New Age. In Rome, it was Venus. In India, it was Kali. In Egypt, it was Isis. In Greek, it was Aphrodite. In Athena, in Cana, it was Ishtar. In Ephesus, it was Diana. In Israel, it was Asherah. But it's the same thing. And again, my friends, we have to understand something that happened historically When Constantine quit quit persecuted the Christians and declared it was a Christian empire, he simply Christianized pagan things like December 25th. We are never told anywhere in the Bible Jesus' birthday is December 25th. And in fact, we know for sure that it wasn't, okay? And, And why do we celebrate that? Because it was, again, it was the winter solstice. Still to this day, we use the word Easter. Easter is Eshtar, the goddess of, what is Eshtar, the goddess of? Fertility. Why is it, my friends, that when we celebrate the resurrection, it doesn't always go with Passover? It ought to, hadn't it? Instead, it's this weird thing. This year it's going to be in March. Sometimes it's in April. It changes all over the place. And people put out bunnies and eggs. Uh, bunnies don't lay eggs. It all dates back to this queen of heaven and Babylonian things. Do you realize hot cross buns? That's not a cross on there originally. It was a T for Tammuz. And my friends, the fact that the Pope is called Pontifus Maximus, that's not a Christian term. It was a pagan term. Why the cardinals were red with those funny tiara hats? It was all pagan. And they just simply Christianized it and gave Christian names to it. And so what they have to do, we have to come up with a Madonna. And thus, Mary became sinless. Mary's not sinless. Put a halo over her head and put a halo over Jesus and just give them different names. And again, my friends, it has nothing to do with the Bible. The real gospel. Why'd that happen? I'll tell you, Satan is a liar. He's a counterfeit. And all of this, and you you send your kids off to college, I guarantee you in the liberal colleges, they're going to say, oh, this Christian stuff, look at this. It was all done before. That's exactly it. Bible deals with it all. It's the queen of heaven. Now the scripture goes on in verse number 19. Do not provoke me to anger, says the Lord. Do not provoke themselves to the shame of their own face. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, behold, my anger, my fury will be poured out on this place, on man and beast and trees and field on fruit of the ground. It will be burned and not quenched. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Add your burnt offerings and your sacrifices and eat meat. For I did not speak to your fathers or command them in the day that I brought you out of Egypt concerning burnt offerings. But this is what I commanded them saying, obey my voice. My friends, let this be your heart tonight. Obey the voice of the Lord and I will be your God and you shall be my people and walk in the ways that I've commanded you that it may be well with you. Yet they did not obey or incline their ear, but walked in the counsels and the imaginations of their evil hearts. They went backwards and not forwards. For since the day that your fathers came out of Egypt until this day, I have sent you all my servants, the prophets, daily rising up early and sending them. 
Yet they did not obey me or incline their ear, but stiffened their neck, and they did worse than their fathers. Therefore you shall speak all these words, but they will not obey you. How hard would it have been to be Jeremiah? To know you're going to be speaking the truth, but they're not going to listen. You shall also call them, but they will not answer you. So you shall say to them, this is the nation that does not obey the voice of the Lord their God, nor receive correction. Truth has perished and been cut off from their mouth. Cut off your hair and cast it away and take up lamentation on the desolate heights. For the Lord has rejected and forsaken the generation of his wrath. For the children of Judah have done evil in my sight, says the Lord. They have set their abominations in the house which is called by my name to pollute it. They have built the high places of Tophet, which is in the valley of the son of Hemon, to burn their sons and their daughters with fire, which I did not command them, nor come into their mind. They sacrificed their children alive, burning them alive with fire. We look with a gasp on that, but I want to tell you, the sins of America dwarf what that is in comparison. We are murdering babies and selling their body parts. Not even the Nazis did that. It is the most barbaric thing I've ever heard of in my life. Therefore, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when it no more will be called Tophet or the valley of the son of heaven, of him, but the valley of slaughter, for they will bury Tophet until there is no room. The corpses of this people will be birds uh, 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 for the birds of heaven and the beasts of the earth. No one will frighten them away, and I will cause to cease from the cities of Judah and from the streets of Jerusalem the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, for the land shall be desolate. My friends, now is time that we walk with the Lord, that we repent from our sinful ways, that we get our hearts right with the Lord, because I have great news Jesus Christ is coming again. And he's called us to be salt and light in a dark world. And I do believe with all of my heart, if we as the people of God do exactly what the Bible says, if we confess our sins and turn from our wicked ways, then will he hear from heaven. And God's going to answer prayer. There's going to be a great revival in this nation. And I do believe that we could have a president of the United States that is a real born again Christian. Let's be a praying people. Amen. And to encourage you in being a prayer people, go see War Room. It'll be like a, you know, get out there and get them. All right, let's stand.